In the world of entertainment, there's a word that can either be exciting or terrifying. Fan. A person who is passionate about the work that's presented to the public. Whether it's to make you laugh, cry, shout with excitement, curl with suspense, or edge of your seat invested, the people behind the entertainment put their all into it for the love of the craft and hoping to share something for people to enjoy. Fans have always been loud with their opinions, but it's been over the past few years with the rise of the internet and social media that the people behind the entertainment have become self-aware of the fans' praises or critiques. Some see it as a good thing, while others see it as a bad thing. There are some cases where people have to walk on eggshells to say even the smallest praise or critique about a type of entertainment that the fans' overwhelming response can sometimes ruin it for them. Today's form of entertainment I'm covering is animation, more specifically, cartoons. While you see the occasional gatekeeper or fan hater who just wants to spread hate online, there are the good fans who will support newcomers and give praise to the actors, animators, musicians, and creators for their work. But then there's the special fans, the fans whose love of a show is so strong that they become an integral part of the show itself. Hello viewers, my name is Patricia Miranda, and welcome to Media Hall of Fame. These are four different stories of the fans' love and passion of a cartoon resulting in being a part of the show itself. The first story is one of the earliest examples of the fans being integral to their favorite cartoon. It's a pretty well-known fact for those who grew up around the 90s, but I had to talk about it or else there would have been a flood of comments telling me to talk about it. A trio of 13-year-old girls from Waynesboro, Virginia named Renee Carter, Sarah Kreef, and Amy Crosby wrote a 120-page script of one of their favorite cartoons and mailed it to the studio for a consideration to be made into an episode. The creator ended up bringing them to the studio to make it a reality. That show would be the 1990 Warner Brothers animated series Tiny Toon Adventures, and the episode was called Buster and Babs Go Hawaiian. The episode is about Buster and Babs frustrated with being presented mediocre scripts to work with on Tiny Toons, especially an episode where they weren't even in it. It starred Hampton as a courageous knight, rescuing a princess from an evil lord. Buster and Babs go to Amblin Studios to complain about the issue with the show's creator, Steven Spielberg. He offers them a new script written by three 8th grade girls where Buster and Babs go to Hawaii for a vacation. After that, wackiness ensues. According to a well-documented blog from Renee Carter herself called Three from Waynesboro, the process began when, during the school's lunch period, Renee was drawing Buster and Babs. Her friend Heather noted that it looked like Babs was dancing the hula. Renee jokingly drew a grass skirt on Babs, a Hawaiian shirt for Buster, a pair of glasses, lays, and a beach towel, and added the title, Buster and Babs Go Hawaiian, which was inspired by the Garfield and Friends episode, Garfield Goes Hawaiian. After that, Renee continued to draw various in-jokes for their classmates, such as their history teacher giving a boring lecture about the history of Q-tips and an overflowing tub of bubbles, inspired by an incident from her sister and brother-in-law's honeymoon. Amy then made a few drawings of Elmira, and Sarah came up with the story. As for the ending, Amy had an idea where it came from a dream, where Buster and Babs were going on a cruise and end up in a two-person raft back to Acme Acres. They mailed it over to Fox and Burbank and sent it to Stephen himself. Stephen's secretary then delivered it to the desk of Gene McCurdy, who was the president of Warner Brothers Animation at the time. Weeks later, Jean personally called Renee saying that the studio loved the episode and Steven was really impressed with it. They were working on new episodes and had promised to call them later for further discussion. Then the girls and their mothers were flown to California to work on the episode and the rest was history. Looking at the episode of its own merits, it has a classic feel of a typical episode with a few additions to make it stand out. There's a lot of fourth wall breaking jokes to Steven's work, self-aware humor with plot holes and deus ex machinas, and even the girls themselves appearing in the cartoon dictating how the story would end up. The plane's dead. Now back to work. Oh, but girls! That's an actor for you. Always messing with the writer's vision. The concept of Buster and Babs Go Hawaiian eventually became the catalyst for an episode of The Simpsons two years later called The Front. 
In that episode, Bart and Lisa are bored with the new episodes of Itchy and Scratchy, so they decide to write their own episode and send it to the studio. However, they were rejected because they were kids and weren't taken as seriously, so they decide to credit the script under their grandpa's name. Writer Adam Labidas heard the news about Steven Spielberg hiring the teenagers to write an episode of Tiny Toons and thought it would be hilarious if Bart and Lisa submitted an episode of Itchy and Scratchy. There's even a subtle reference at Itchy and Scratchy's end credits where it's almost like the end credits of Buster and Babs Go Hawaiian about sending the money to a studio for a transcript for an episode. It's remarkable that Renee, Amy, and Sarah had gotten the opportunity since there hasn't been another similar event like it since. But what we got from it was a unique experience that influenced animation in a small but exceptional way. Any threes? Go fish. You guys the pizza people? Losers. Reanimation projects have become really popular over the past few years. Dedicated actors, artists, musicians, and animators would perform or animate scenes of a cartoon short, TV episode, or a movie with their own distinctive style. Examples include the Dover Boys reanimation project by Zurel, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show Mama Luigi reanimated project by Andrew Dickman, the Dragon Ball reanimated project by Seven Star Reanimate, and Shrek Retold by 3GI Industries. So, how about an official reanimation project? Well, that's what happened around March 2017, when the Fox animated series Bob's Burgers did a fan art contest called Bob's Fart for fans to submit their fan art and animation, and the winners would be included in an episode. Over 62 fan arts and animations were showcased in the season 8 premiere episode, Brunch Squatch. Tina, Jean, and Louise want a dog and are begging their parents Bob and Linda for one. They both say no, and the kids try to figure a way to get their parents to change their mind. The Belchers see a long line at Jimmy Pesto's restaurant, learning that he's opening around brunch time, so they decide to do the same. Meanwhile, Felix, Mr. Fishoder's brother, is hiding around Bob's Burgers for a long, elaborate game of hide-and-seek. Louise discovers him hiding at the dumpster, and he promises to give her $250 to hide around Bob's Burgers for an additional day to win the game. Louise brings Tina and Jean into the mix to distract Bob and Linda while hiding Felix in the basement to help him not being found by Mr. Fishoder to receive the money so that they can buy a dog. According to creator Lauren Bouchard, he had loved sharing fan art of Bob's Burgers on social media, and it was even featured in the comics occasionally. So, the decision to make an episode showcasing fan art was something that they eventually needed to do. I know that some people were not big fans of this design choice, but I personally love it. This is a unique idea, and I love seeing the different backgrounds and character designs. Especially this anime scene, that's my favorite. I hope we can see another attempt of it in the future, and not just restrict it to just online. For me personally, I love watching this episode because when you're in the middle of a scene and they're in this other style, for a moment, that's the style of the show. I really like reinterpreting the show, seeing it look a little differently and still have it be the show. And I sure like getting art from the fans and just seeing how they see, how they think. Well, this has been really fun and not weird at all, but we better get back to our dingy lives. As you guys know, I'm a massive Hey Arnold fan. I've done a lot of videos discussing about it. One of my biggest videos that I've ever done was my History of Hey Arnold the Jungle Movie video, where I brought up how the fans were responsible to convince Nickelodeon to produce the second movie to finally get closure on their favorite characters. Now, imagine we had to wait another 20 years to see an inkling of a finale, and we had gotten it from a car commercial airing in another country. That's exactly what fans of the 1983 animated series Dungeons and Dragons went through. Based on the fantasy role-playing game of the same name, the Dungeons and Dragons animated series ran on CBS for 27 episodes. It's about six kids named Hank, Sheila, Eric, Diana, Bobby, and Presto who enter into the realm of Dungeons and Dragons by riding on a roller coaster at an amusement park. They meet up with the dungeon master who gives them a magical item, and they become a D&D class member. Hank is the ranger and leader of the group, Sheila is the thief, Eric is the cavalier, Diana is the acrobat, Presto is the magician, and Bobby is the barbarian. 
The main plot of the series is for the group to find their way home, as they defeat antagonists Wenger and Tiamat, as well as obstacles getting in their way to accomplish their goal. The show ended on a cliffhanger with no knowledge of whether the kids got home. That is until 2006 when BCI Eclipse, a media distribution company, released the series on DVD in Region 1, where the original cast reunited to record an audio play of the final episode as a bonus feature. Then, in July 20th, 2011, the show's screenwriter Michael Reeves posted a PDF file of the finals episode's script on his blog. Then, on May 27th, 2019, a Renault Quid Outsider car commercial in Brazil featuring the characters from the Dungeons & Dragons animated series premiered, with the kids trying to escape from Vanguard and Tiamat, with Dungeon Master driving a car telling them to escape with it. Presto creates a portal with his magic and they finally end up going home. For fans who had no idea about the leaked script or audio play of said script, they saw the closest thing to a finale of their childhood show in a car commercial in Brazil. Now, why Brazil, you may ask? Well, the show is very popular over there. They even released a series of figurines of the characters in 2019, courtesy of the Brazilian company Iron Studios. I'm sure that fans didn't want to see this car commercial as the only way to see the conclusion of a long-canceled animated series. So two fans named Marshall Hubbard and Ryan Need decided to tackle animating the final episode using the original footage from the show and getting the dialogue from the audio play with some additional lines recorded by Katie Lee, the voice of Sheila. Their goal was to stick to the original script as much as possible. Some scenes had to be altered, either due to limitations of the animation or to give fans a more satisfying conclusion. In the original script, the Dungeon Master opened a portal back to the museum park and offers the kids to stay at the realm and continue to fight evil. The answer would have been revealed at the next season, but the show was cancelled. The fans decided to present an alternative ending on their episode, ending it on a happier note. Ryan Need's thoughts of the final product were, The creators of this episode are fans first, amateur animators second. There are many things I wish I could have done differently in this presentation, but I am very proud of what we have accomplished, and it is my hope that those who love this cartoon as much as we do will be pleased of what we put together. It seems that not just the fans were happy with the hard work that Marshall and Ryan did to give the series a proper ending. According to a statement by Ernest Gary Gygax Jr., the son of Dungeons & Dragons co-creator Gary Gygax, he said, This was not the chosen closure that my father had so wished, as he had desired at least another season or three. With that in mind, this fan-generated not-for-profit episode is first-rate and deserves to be seen and shared with other D&D gaming fans. And perhaps now with this in hand, more parents will look for the cartoon and share it with 21st century youngsters. While the final product may not exactly look the best with its stark juxtaposition between the old and new animation and voice acting, Marshall and Ryan did a very admirable job giving the fans the closure they've always wanted. First lesson, Apprentice, never keep a lady waiting. The last story is one that happened just recently, but it's nonetheless made a very impactful mark on a phenomenal episode to a phenomenal show. In fact, this is what inspired of the making of this video in the first place. The 2010s was a great year for animated shows, and the show that kickstarted the new golden age was Pendleton Ward's Adventure Time. The show is about a young boy named Finn and his best friend, a dog named Jake, and their crazy adventures in the Land of Ooh, alongside other characters such as Bimo, a small video game-shaped robot who live with Finn and Jake, the Ice King, Princess Bubblegum from the Candy Kingdom, Marceline the Vampire Queen, and many more. Originally pitched as a seven-minute cartoon on Nickelodeon in 2007 in the animated anthology show Random Cartoons by Fred Seibert, it was rejected twice, and instead was brought to Cartoon Network, where it became a smash hit. The show lasted for eight years, ending on September 3rd, 2018. But that didn't mean the end for Adventure Time, at least not counting the comics. One year later, on October 23rd, 2019, it was announced that Adventure Time was going to be airing four specials on HBO Max called Adventure Time Distant Lands. Adventure Time! Come on, grab your friends, we'll go to very distant lands. Ha! I see what you did there. 
These four specials were going to feature both new and old characters, exploring new locations, delving deeper into the backstories of the characters, and having more creative freedom to tell more riskier stories and broadening LGBTQ representation without the fear of censoring it. As of the making of this video, two of the four specials have been released. And today we're going to be talking about the second special, Obsidian. Don't worry, we're not going to go into major spoilers for those who haven't seen it. The story takes place in the Glass Kingdom, where a dragon named Molto Larvo is freeing himself from a locked door he was trapped in for hundreds of years. A kid named Glass Boy believes that the only way the dragon can stay trapped is to get the one responsible for trapping it in the first place. Marceline the Vampire Queen. Together with Princess Bubblegum, they go to the Glass Kingdom to try to stop Moto Larvo from escaping his prison. Obsidian has only been out for less than a few months, but it's been unanimously praised by critics and fans as one of the best episodes of the series. One of the most memorable moments that they all brought up was when Marceline sings a song to Princess Bubblegum called Monster. What's amazing about this is that this song was written by a fan. That person would be electropop musician Karen Havey, a.k.a. Half Shy. Half Shy was known for writing Adventure Time inspired songs, such as Betty, A Little Bit of Madness, about the relationship between Simon and Betty. In My Element, about the friendship between Finn and Jake. According to an interview from Paul Thomas, aka GuntherFan1992 on Tumblr, Halfshy revealed how she was able to write a song for Distant Lands. While working on In My Element, Adam Muto, the showrunner and executive producer of Adventure Time after Pendleton Ward stepped down during season 5, purchased her album Bedroom Visionaries on Bandcamp. She wrote a message thanking him for purchasing her album, as well as sharing both Betty and In My Element to him. He eventually shared her songs on Twitter and later messaged her saying that they were working on a secret project and asked if she was interested in working on it. She said yes. As the project went further along, Muto revealed to Halfshy that there would be two songs that Marceline would be singing, and he gave her the task to write a love song. She then stated, So, I read this story and loved the idea of a dragon mirrored in Marceline, thinking on how they both built a protective shell, how she grew up tough for a reason, but now she can be vulnerable to PB. Being soft sure isn't easy. It means somebody can reach into your heart and give it a tweak. Mess things up a bit in there. Safer to grow a thick skin and never let anybody in again. It takes real courage to take that armor off, and you'll probably need a hand getting it up over your head. But true connection, allowing yourself to be a bit tender, is one of the sweetest feelings in the world. She then wrote the initial demo with the first two versions mostly intact, and her and Muto went back forth a few times editing it into the final version. Monster was the song that was heavily promoted on trailers of Obsidian, including an extended version of it sung by King Princess. As of the making of this video, Monster is on the top 5 listened on the Adventure Time playlist, with fans comparing it to songs such as Everything Stays, I'm Just Your Problem, and I Remember You as one of the best songs featured in the entire series. I completely agree with all the praises of the special. It's funny, it's heartwarming, it's sad, it has great callbacks to previous episodes, and it answers a lot of questions that fans have been wanting to know for a very long time. If this is the last time that we see Marceline and Princess Bubblegum, then I will be 100% satisfied. I'm so glad that this song caught on so fast with a lot of people because it is that good. To the cast and crew of Adventure Time as well as Half Shy, thank you so much for your amazing work. And I know we'll never grow old together Cause you'll never grow old to me You're pink in my cheeks And I love that it means I'm a little bit soft Before we go, I want to give off a quick honorable mention. Around 2004, the Nickelodeon animated series Invader Zim was released on DVD, containing animatics, interviews, English and Spanish dub voices, English and Urkin subtitles, and commentaries featuring the cast and crew. 
But one of the features that was included was the fanboy commentary, where the cast and crew invited two fans to do commentary on the season two episode, Battle of the Planets. <laughs> then we've got with us, we've got two fans with us. Yeah. Who did nothing but enjoy the show. Introduce yourself. And again. that was enough. Apparently. Hey, hey. Unfortunately, this was the least documented of the five stories. The fans' names were never mentioned in the commentary, and they didn't really talk as much as the cast and crew. I even tried to look it up online, and there was no information about this commentary. The only thing that popped up online that said fanboy commentary was the commentary section on the Rogue Squadron podcast website. Even when the fans of YouTube posted the Invader Zim commentary for them to watch, the Battle of the Planets commentary was nowhere to be found. So I had to do my own investigation. I first sent a tweet to Jonan Vasquez, the creator of Invader Zim, and heard nothing. Not a surprise. Then I messaged some of the Invader Zim writers, such as Roman Dirge, Frank Conniv, and Eric Truhard. Out of the three, Eric was the one who responded back to me. He told me that he had no recollection of who the fans were. Since he had nothing to do with the Battle of the Planets or even remember being in the booth, he couldn't recall. I listened to the commentary and yes, he was indeed in the booth with the cast, crew, and fans despite having nothing to do with this episode. Yeah, it's a recurring gag in these commentaries that Eric Truhard would be commenting on an episode he had nothing to do with. However, he did tell me to go to the Invader Zim Reddit page, as well as message a person named Johnny from Operation Pigeonheads to see if they would know about it. Johnny was able to help me a lot with connecting people who both worked on the show and who worked on the DVDs. But it was thanks to Jason Stiff, who was one of the post-production supervisors of Invader Zim, that I finally got the answer I was looking for. It turned out that it was two employees who was working at Nickelodeon at the time, which just so happens to be fans of the show. They were Justin Smith and Russell Davis. Justin worked on additional post-production on shows such as Hey Arnold, The Fairly Odd Parents, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Danny Phantom, Chalk Zone, Cat Scratch, and Avatar The Last Airbender. While Russell was a digital artist at Nickelodeon from 2003 to 2006. The next step for me was to contact them about being a part of the commentary. But then I received information from Johnny about Justin and let's just say I dodged a major bullet. So then I messaged Russell on LinkedIn and heard nothing. I had decided to stop my pursuing on this subject, especially since they were people who didn't qualify as fan in my opinion. They were working at Nickelodeon at the time. They were not just regular fans with no connections with the cast, crew, or company. So, thanks again to Johnny, I found a little easter egg that I can quickly cover for this video. One of the animators who worked on the Invader Zim Mopiness of Doom animation project led by Soapy Waffles was named Emily Rose Satterfield. She was featured in the 18th issue of the Invader Zim comic book series where she's getting a burrito at Burrito King. Well, that's it everyone. I hope that you enjoy this special video I put together. The reason why I wanted to make it was because I wanted to highlight the good things that fans have done in the animation community. It's so sad to see and hear the negative voices and comments speak louder than the positives. Jake Gyllenhaal has the most punchable face of all time. <laughs> I'd like nothing more than to sock him in his ugly, soft, starry-eyed pug face. <laughs> Kristen Bell seems like the kind of person I'd be thrilled to be paired up with for a school project, but then would never want to hang out with her otherwise. That's probably true. Is Kamel Nanjiani's multiple colors? Yes. Every shade of your mom's lipstick. And her butthole. But I hope that I was able to help it lead back to the right path. At least a little. Animation is a beautiful medium that can showcase breathtaking art, tell timeless stories with compelling characters, present engaging or humorous narratives, and highlight music that speaks to the soul of the body and mind. Whether old or new, animation should be loved and appreciated. As Chuck Jones once quoted, animation isn't the illusion of life. It is life. For these fans, their hard work and passion paid off and will forever be archived into our fondest memories. We are who we are Why don't I be me and you be you We're spreading color around us We're lighting up the sky, it's what we do We shouldn't care about anyone Or anything that brings us down So come on now, let's be free Just be yourself Keep on
Like you, what you like?